Hey everyone. Excellent. All right. So anytime you want more information or want to take a deeper dive into any of this stuff, we always have these workshops uh, each week. And um, anyway, there you go. The link is above in the chat if you like. Let's move on. So uh, a couple weeks ago we were together. We made that session much more lesson-based. Hopefully um, everyone understood uh, where I was going with that as far as the supply and demand strategy. Let's take that a step further today. And uh, one thing we didn't go over in that session is obviously this is all about structure and location. If you're looking for the specific rules to the strategy, uh, there's not many rules, there's very few simple rules, but they're all around structure and location. Okay. Uh, trend plays no part in what we do. We love trend, but um, you know, trend just means prices are moving in one direction or the other. So we want to be in before that happens, right? That's the whole point. Um, so it comes down to structure and location. So what you'll see on the charts, and and you have been seeing this, but I wanted to make sure you understood what you've been seeing, are a bunch of different colored boxes and circles. So on the left. We have our higher probability opportunities where we typically take normal risk, whatever that risk is that you're comfortable with. And on the right, when you see a gray box, for example, um, while often it has really good structure, location will be poor. So still meets the minimum criteria we're looking for, and um, but lower probability than the group on the left, therefore, you might want to consider reducing risk. So whatever your normal position size is, you may want to cut that in half. Just a thought. Okay. All right. Yeah, we're going to look at the dollar Sam Bragg in just a few minutes. And um, the dollar has been key for us. We focus on that market. Uh, uh, it's one of our top key markets we look at. So let's start over here. On the left, our yellow box means good structure, good location. When I say location, I'm talking about our, our supply and demand diagram, right? Remember the pro space above and below, right? Supply and demand, and then all the novice space in the middle. I think everybody re remembers what we went over in those sessions. And if you didn't, just you can always go watch the uh, recording in the last session. Those are always uh, FX Street puts those out there and holds on to those. And um, so that's a... Good location, good structure level, the yellow box. The green box just, green box was typically a yellow box that is now uh, prices on its way or nearing target. So this level that it worked out and we're just tracking it to the to the target. And then a blue circle, which we'll, you'll see um, a decent amount uh, is a possible new level developing. So once you get good at supply and demand, you'll see that you'll be able to uh, determine or predict where the next quality level is going to develop. And that's all based on what's to the left. So we'll often put a blue circle around that area and watch that level develop so we're ready for it. And um, over on the right, so the gray box typically means good structure, poor location. And if we're going to give up on location, for example, we, re we better really make up for it on structure. So structure better be really good. Uh, otherwise, it just won't meet the minimum criteria we're looking for. If you take a look at this little chart on the right, for example, this supply zone above, uh, let's assume that's a yellow box supply zone. And then price comes back to that level and falls as it should. But inside that drop, we get a new supply zone, supply zone to develop. Well, now, this activity in here is the novice space, but, but up here, you're at least you're in the upper portion of the novice space, so often that will become a gray box supply zone because it's inside of this novice space range now. Does that make sense? It's not out at the extremes where the competition to buy and sell is tremendous. Um, yellow circle means... For example, in the equity index markets, that would be an overnight level. In the FX markets, that would just be an off hours. Just, you know, there, there's, there's the session times that uh, are heavy in FX, and then there's the session times that are really dead and not much going on. So that's what the yellow, bo yellow circle would mean there. A white circle means it's a level that has been 
uh, already it may have been a yellow box the first time, but now price has come back there once and, and worked out well. It's coming back again, and our rules tell us that we should take that level again. So that becomes a white circle. Often we'll take levels multiple times, right? We'll take entries at levels multiple times. If the supply-demand equation there suggests that there's still a significant imbalance, enough of an imbalance to get uh, price to turn, then we'll keep that level in, but that'll be a white circle. Does that make sense? So hopefully now, after looking at our probability guide, you're, you'll understand kind of what you're looking at as we get to the charts. So let's dive in. And after last, uh, our last time together, that lesson we went over, let's now start to apply all this. Okay? So after, uh, let's start with the dollar. And we can start right here with the four-hour chart. Um, so after trading off our demand zone, anybody in our group get this? Jasmine and I bought the dollar down here. Um, this was a, a yellow box demand zone below all the novice space. Okay, and we were planning this one for a while. Price dipped below all the novice space down into our demand zone, and now it's, you know, rallied. Uh, yeah, it didn't stay there for long, and typically it won't. Why? Because that competition to buy down here is so great, it forces price back to the middle. Um, now, price is nearing uh, some supply up here, 94.50, so we'll watch for that, really 94.55. And that is in the dollar. Yellow circle there, so not a high probability level, but nevertheless, uh, we, would, we would expect price to, uh, you know, slow down here and, and turn lower. So keep this level in mind as we go through FX markets against the dollar. And by the way, if you're new to these sessions, today we are going to focus on FX markets maybe a little bit more than other markets, but typically in these sessions... Uh, we focus on all the major asset classes, stocks, futures, forex, options, and um, what we, you know, the strategy that uh, that I developed that we go over here is, um, you know, equally applicable across all those asset classes and then any financial purpose, right? Day trading, swing trading, longer term investing. Uh, we are not still long. No, Jasmine and I are not still long from down here. We exited that position already. Okay, uh, let's keep going. So, and we would keep this 91.85 demand zone in here because price just touched the level and turned higher, suggesting there's still quite a bit, uh, big imbalance down here. Uh, looks like banks are buying dollars down here and, uh, and that they're selling dollars 94.55. So keep those levels in mind. Let's move to a different time frame, and you will see that Inside of this rally, keyword there, inside of this rally, we have a gray box demand zone, 93.35. Okay, Remember, that's if you look to the left, that's right inside of all this novice space. So lower probability level, but the structure is there, So, um, and the structure is pretty good, so we'll, uh, we'll go with that. But again, any position here or related to this, perhaps a short euro position, when the dollar's at 93.35, that would be, uh, um, you know, for us, according to our rules, we would reduce position size because probability uh, is not as high with that level. And, of course, below all this, we have uh, more demand starting around 92.40. But we're well off that at the moment, so no reason to spend too much time there. And even deeper into the middle here, or maybe even above the middle, we have another gray box demand zone, 93.80. So again, this lower probability level. Uh, we like holding out for the, um, the, the yellow box levels, but uh, I want to show you all of them here. So there's one. And, and again, don't forget about this 94.55. That level is getting close. So with that said, let's go to major markets uh, against the dollar. And I can go to any market you want to look at. It really doesn't matter. So if you have a market you're really, you really want to see or, or, or go over with regard to supply and demand, you can type in the chat, chat and I'll try to get to it. Uh, but why don't we move to the euro? Okay, some of these levels you're aware of because we've gone over them before. 
So after turning lower from our uh, supply zone here on the daily, which lined up with some uh, obviously demand in the dollar, uh, price is falling, but where is it falling to? Well, we've already had one significant turn off of our demand zone here, actually two. So price was back here twice. It just came back for a third time. Um, uh, you know, not a surprise that it's going deeper, if not lower, into the level. We've Again, we've been back here three, almost four times. But we do have some demand a little bit lower, 116.23, that area. Now, what we'd want to watch for is, does that level line up with that dollar supply? It likely does, but something to uh, watch out for, yeah, okay? And uh, someone just mentioned the, the NASDAQ. Alina mentioned the NASDAQ. Pushkar mentioned the Nikkei. So with the dollar down here into demand, we'd want to see if any of those equity index markets are at or near supply at that time. Okay. The, uh, the S&P has a level, uh, I believe, lines up with that one as well. So always looking at those key inverse relationships. But the, the key is you, know, you have to get the supply-demand right. But once you do can really take advantage of uh, key correlations out there. We can't go over all of them in these sessions. There's uh, four big ones that we look at, but um, uh, there's a couple that we just, uh, we, I, we can't go over in these sessions, but let's keep going. So we do have some Euro supply up around 117.26. Don't forget gray box supply, so a little bit lower probability given its location. Structure-wise looks fine. Uh, location, not so great. Okay, and there's that. Yes, we can, um, uh, let's, do, let's go over some more Forex markets and then we'll go back and look at uh, NQ and Nikkei. Um, once we get through these, we should have time. All right, let's move on to the Aussie dollar. Also, when looking at the FX markets, it really doesn't matter to me whether we look at the spot market or the futures market. So, you know, we'll go to the Aussie dollar Next, if you want to go to Aussie Futures, we can do that. If you want to see it on Aussie Spot, we can do that. So you tell me if it's a, if it's a big deal to you because it, it really doesn't matter to me. Those markets are, are different as far as, um, you know, what they are and all that. Don't get me wrong. But uh, when we look at them for, you know, market turns and market moves, it doesn't matter. Okay. Do you want to look at the futures? Okay, let's mix it up here. Let's go to the Aussie Dollar Futures Okay, so after trading lower from uh, our supply zone here off the daily, and we went over that in our sessions here. If anybody in our little group here is still in this move, um, let me show you where we might uh, find some demand. We're going to go to the four-hour chart for that. Okay, here we go. So, yeah, the, the Aussie dollar, again, after coming into multiple supply zones, we have another supply zone that developed down here, 7202. Gray box supply zone, just like the diagram I showed you, this developed after the turn from our high probability supply zone. So um, if this rallies, should get a turn lower here, just lower probability, may want to reduce that position size. One of the reasons why price is barely touching these supply zones and falling in the Aussie dollar is because demand is so much lower, right? So that's evident on, on really all these uh, time frames. Um, even this 68 even uh, demand down here, we've been there and been through that. So there, there is room. And even when you go to smaller time frames, it's still uh, it's kind of hard to find any near-term demand zones. Let me go to the 60 here. You'll see what I'm talking about. So... You know, we're entering this area. Price has been falling right through this with ease. Why? What do we call this area here again? The novice space. Okay. A lot of people look at this and say, wait a second, there's demand. Price should turn higher. No. It's the opposite of demand. Right? Novice space. Orders are filled. And all we have is a bunch of pivot lows here. Those pivot lows fill the buy orders, right, that banks have sitting there. Um opening room for price to drop and that's why you're seeing that however once we get down to the 7015 area we have two gray box demand zones sitting on top of each other 
I'll blow this up and go back so we can see that a little clearer. Okay, there we go. Two levels sitting on top of each other right there. Okay. So, um, so there's two fresh supply zones, two fresh demand zones in the Aussie dollar. And notice we look at multiple time frames to, to determine that, to find that, to identify that, whatever you want to call it. When you get too rigid on your time frames, you know, that's like a doc, that's like a radiologist saying, okay, uh, this person's got an issue with their ankle, but I only want to see these two images, these two angles, only take two pictures, and I want them to be these two angles always, no matter what. If anybody comes in and complains about an ankle, always only take these two pictures. Would they ever do that? No, they wouldn't do that, right? They wouldn't do that. They take multiple images from multiple angles. Why do they do that? Because they're doing that to it to find what they're you know this the, the key uh, information they're looking for on one ankle, multiple pictures of one ankle. It's exactly what we're doing here. We're looking at multiple time frames to properly assess the objective supply and demand in this market. And um, if we get too rigid on what time frames we use, then we'll often miss something. And uh, we don't want to do that. Okay, let's keep going. And let's go to, uh, why don't we go to the pound? Futures or spot, doesn't matter to me. I can keep alternating if you want. And I know the majority of people that, you want to stick to the futures? Well, why don't we alternate a little bit, because um, even though we only have a few people in our session here, there's always a, a ton more that watch the recording, so um, we'll, we'll mix it up. I uh, have something for everybody. All right. You know, and, and when I was on the trading floor uh, back at the, the CME, I was working on a um, uh, big trade desk facilitating uh, big orders from banks, institutions, money managers, and all that. Most of my time was spent in the FX arena. Uh, at there and what you realize <clears throat> now as I've said many times it was illegal for me to trade my account I could not uh, trade any accounts or influence any accounts that had anything to do with the markets that uh, was were traded at the exchange why because I had access to the orders that determine price where banks are buying and where banks are selling and all I did was, you know, after a while, take price charts and say, and, uh, you know, having the orders in front of me, you know where price is going to turn and you know where it's going to go, right? There's like no, no question. So, uh, and it's not just, it's not like we have all the orders, but you can kind of see most of the orders out there at the exchange. Uh, not all of them, but a lot of them. So that's why you can't trade your own account if you're handling those orders because it, you wouldn't, you know, you can't lose really with that information but what I want everybody to understand is you know um, I remember when I started to tell people you know what I'm I'm uh, you know I brought I've looked at enough price charts I've matched those price charts up with the real orders from big banks around the world and this picture of demand and supply I am crystal clear with it I don't need to research this practice this anymore I've got it I know what this looks like on a price chart you know what people would say? Some of them would say, yeah, but you have such an edge down here because you actually see the orders, right? You, and, I, and I'd say, yeah, you know, I have the orders, but but the, the orders I have access to are the orders on our trade desk, you know, and the, and the groups around us. And more, you know, Morgan Stanley wasn't too far from us, and Goldman Sachs was over there. And so you can kind of get an idea of where, you know, other people's orders are. But there's still other orders out there around the world, right? Let me ask you this, because I realized this, like, back then. Where's the one place where you can see the footprints of everyone's supply and demand? Of the supply and demand that represents all the orders around the world. Exactly, the chart. So I felt an urgency to leave the trading floor and do this from home, which is what I did. I went home and, you know, then just started trading and traded for years at home. Um, you know, nothing's changed, still do. But that was my urgency. 
and people that were just you know making money trading um you know on a trading floor maybe in, in, in the trading pit or whatever um great that's fine you know they, they paid for the right to be there and and see orders and trade off orders and all that but i was just convinced and i could have been wrong at the time but i, I at the time i was very convinced i said look everything i need to see is right here on these price charts um uh, so that's all i'm sharing with you here how the markets really work and um and and what those you know what all those what those footprints look like on the price chart you know the the best thing that happened to me down there is um, I didn't have anybody talking to me about conventional technical analysis. I didn't really know what all that stuff was or any of that. Um, a little bit of it, but but not much. Um, and certainly when I started to learn about it, I, I could care less. Um, all right. Let's look at the pound. And again, these little stories are just to help you understand, you know, what's really going on here. I want to scrunch up for a second. Let's go back. Here's our yellow box supply zone way up there, way outside of the novice space, as it uh, as they always will be. Um, competition to sell up here is way too great. That's why prices can't even get close to that at the moment. So we're forced to deal in the middle with some gray box levels that are just a little bit lower probability. Um, so after falling from our supply zone, we're down into some gray box demand. Uh, we could get a rally in here. Of course, any of these levels, you're going to want to watch the dollar also. That's why we started with it. And um, any markets that are opposite the dollar, just make sure the dollar is either into um, uh, an opposing zone or, or certainly offering quite a bit of room, right, for example, for the pound to run. So, you know, the pound's kind of likely to stay in this range here, so we'll leave that one alone right now at least. Um, uh, but that's a bigger time frame, so that's a, that's, that doesn't look like a lot of room, but it is. Okay, this is a daily chart we're looking at. Let's work our way down, and you'll see we have some supply to look at. Um, right up here, 129.23. Okay. Uh, again, gray box supply zone, quite a bit of trading to the left. This is not a full position type level. Uh, the nice thing about it, though, there is a big profit zone associated with this one. So if and when price gets down through this stuff, this is typically just novice space. Um, uh, price, act, you know, price action like this does not uh, typically turn price higher. Right? In, instead, the presence of all this trading activity facilitates you know, price moving easily through that area. So watch for that in the pound. And um, and there you go. Let's go over to the Canadian dollar. We'll stick to the spot market. Uh, good question, Sam Bragg. Um, so, uh, so, you know, for the sessions we deliver in um, in the program, uh, Jasmine, I don't know if you know Jasmine, but Jasmine and I, we uh, we probably spend uh, about a couple hours uh, independently going over uh, the markets that we cover, which is all the major markets, and um, and then um, and then we get together and combine all those. Uh, yeah, she is amazing, unbelievable, uh, fantastic uh, <clears throat> trader, and 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 um, uh, the best I've ever seen at supply and demand. So she's great. But we also have help. So um, being extremely honest with you always, we also have help. So I think I've shown you this before. I'm only showing you this because you just asked. And, um, but we do have help. So I, uh, you know, I built an algorithm. I had an algorithm built that quantifies supply and demand. It does it all automatically. So uh, this is the Veritas algorithm we use. Uh, stocks, futures, Forex, options. And um, it, it plots the supply demand levels on the chart. So uh, this really helps us speed up our analysis. And like if I wanted to go over to um, Forex. And, uh, you know, our members are able to, uh, you know, benefit from, from, uh, from this. We don't sell this. We don't sell the algorithm to people. Why, did you think we, why don't you think we sell it? Why wouldn't we sell this to people and offer it to people? Uh, let me just look here. Now that's not the one I wanted to look at. 
Um, well, we can come back to that one. Let's look at the Euro Yen here. Why wouldn't we sell this and offer this out there? It's really good. Uh, we trade off this uh, constantly because it works. Okay. Um, anyone that has any, you know, be careful with. It. I'm just, I'm just saying this out of, you know, concern for you. Anyone that has any, you know, automated tool or automated strategy or automated signal and is uh, selling it to you for, you know, whatever. Um, if it worked that great, they probably wouldn't be selling it to you. Uh, we can use it here, and again, I, I, I don't think I ever bring this up, but I did because you asked, so I don't want you to think like uh, um, we're able to run through all these markets uh, by hand. We do, but, uh, but we certainly have help when we need it. Looking at the Euro-Yen, okay, so we do have a supply zone up here, 124.70. Notice it's the break uh, through all this demand here. So, and a nice initial profit zone down to uh, in here. So, so keep an eye out for that one if you trade Euro Yen in the spot market. And then, um, uh, yeah, that level looks fine. All right, let's get back to our, our other workspace here. Okay. And you don't look. You don't need the algorithm to, uh, you know. You don't need it. You can, you know, if you're really focused on fresh quality levels, you're not looking at all these other levels that are in the middle. Um, you know, or supply demand level that is right in the middle of the novice space. We don't even call that a supply demand level, right? So, um, all right. Well, we got to figure that out, uh, uh, Galena. Okay, looking at dollar Canadian, kind of getting off off uh, topic here. After turning higher from our uh, demand, unfortunately, that kind of pushes price right back to the middle, which is expected. That's where price normally is, right? That's where price spends most of its time. And um, but let's look at the four-hour chart of the Canadian. Okay, if the Canadian continues to move higher, again, it's right in the middle, so we're not going to spend much time here. Uh, One thirty-five oh seven. We're going to have some, uh, uh, likely to have some supply up there. Gray box supply, so nothing fantastic. Let's move over to the yen. I think a couple people wanted the yen. We can switch back to the futures here if you want. Doesn't matter to me. On this one, just uh, if you're a spot trader, just flip the chart over, and you've got the same level in the spot market. All right, let's start with the, oh, not the daily chart. Oh, I'm sorry, the four hour. Here we go. So let's see. All right, so we're, we're finally getting into our uh, gray box demand zone down here in the end. Okay, so watch for that. And let's go to, let's just take a look at that in the spot real quick. I'm going to come right back to the futures. So I always want to double check, make sure everything makes sense. Uh, yep, looks fine. So, yeah, so the, the challenge here, though, is um, you can see why these are gray boxes, right? They're right in the middle of all this. Um, you know, we want the levels below and above all that. Uh, those are our key levels. So the fact that price didn't trade too deep into this demand zone below kind of limits the profit zone with these uh, two supply zones in the novice space. Uh, but nevertheless, we would expect the yen to uh, stop rallying here and turn lower, or of course, just the opposite in the futures. Right. right. Now let's go back to the futures. And that's the four-hour chart of the yen. Let's go down to the 30-minute fut yen futures. You'll see if we do get a rally, but again, this level's in the middle. There's two levels on top of each other here, starting at 95.68. Okay. And uh, and that's really it. I mean, that's the that's the state of supply and demand in the end. All right. Uh, so, I don't know how many people trade the peso here, but we do have. Um, after trading off of our demand, let's go to the daily here. 
Uh, oh, this is the spot. I'm sorry. Let's go to the futures. Yeah, so just a little bit lower in the futures, just a little bit higher in the spot. You're, we're coming into an ugly area where you, you'll probably see prices slow down. Uh, don't know that you're going to get a big bounce from this level. That is not a quality demand zone. Um, it does meet the minimum requirements we're looking for, but that's just for a, a half risk, uh, half position trade. So, uh, again, I, I don't think many people here trade the peso. We don't get a lot of requests for it. So let's move on. So let's look at the New Zealand against the U.S. And here we're going to start with the daily. I believe we went over this one a couple times in our FX Street sessions. Not positive, but notice how this is what I was talking about before. You see how price has reached this supply zone on the, that we see on the daily here three times? All three times, price barely touches the level and falls, suggesting a significant supply-demand imbalance up there. In other words, banks are big sellers in this market at 67, you know, 75. Does that make sense? So if price went back up there again, we would expect it to fall again. Now, every time you go back to this area or an area like this, the, you know, the supply is being filled. So a level that was extremely out of balance is becoming less out of balance with each successive rally into that area. Um, but let's work our way down. So that's the supply side of the equation. Nice big profit zone through the novice space down to our first demand zone at 64.83. And that's sitting just below this uh, low here. Sometimes we'll call this secondary evidence, meaning the level itself or levels themselves give us you know, enough evidence to say, hey, demand exceeds supply here. Banks are likely big buyers here. Then we get a pullback. But price, you know, price barely gets there but doesn't. That can only happen because there's such a big supply-demand imbalance down here, obviously, on the demand side. So um, there's room down to this level, but down here we would expect prices to stop falling and turn higher. Um, and that's uh, really below all this novice base. You're seeing price move so quickly through this area uh, because of what the area looks like. It's the novice base. There's nothing to stop price from uh, falling. That's why it's moving so quick. Absolutely, you would watch the dollar with uh, with all these. That euro yen we looked at, not so much, but but the rest of these, yes. Okay, I know we've been looking at uh, FX markets for uh, basically the whole time. Why don't we move over because uh, we don't have a ton of time left and walk through some other markets? Let's go do that. So we can take a look at the S&P, um, or uh, actually someone wanted the NASDAQ. Let's go to the NASDAQ. So we, uh, we posted about this entry the other day, the NASDAQ uh, yesterday, and the, or the day before, down into our demand zone for the second time. This is not a fresh level, but we had two key inverse markets into supply. So um, and it looks like just uh, early this morning, uh, price got very close. I don't know that it touched this uh, uh, gray circle supply zone. The gray circle just means, well, it means two things. One, it's a circle uh, because it's an overnight level, right? And it's gray because it's in the middle of this range. Okay. Uh, nevertheless, it's, it's working out fine. That competition to sell, again, is pushing price back to the middle. Uh, the other big thing in, in equities is when we look at the S&P futures, um, or what's the good chart here to look at? Probably, well, let's go to the four hour. The big thing in the, in the equities is the significant, the, the fresh demand zones that likely have a really big supply demand imbalance are much lower. They're not close, right? Yesterday, the day, bef yesterday, the day before, we were 
at or coming out of all of these demand zones, but none of them were fresh. Okay, so they worked out fine. Inverse markets in our favor, all that good stuff, but uh, but none of them were fresh. Now that we've broken through the 3,300 um, uh, demand that worked out well for us a bunch of times, we now have these areas of supply up here that, um, and specifically, I don't know that we got up here. If you wanted to ratchet that down to reduce the risk, we were looking at the 3,329. That did not meet entry this morning. Over in the spiders, which is the ETF for the S&P, yeah, we did not get up to our 332.60 either. So we'll watch for that. You know, prices can certainly go higher in there. Uh, but, but that was a key area to, to look at. Uh, that dollar rally and lack of supply until a little bit higher are one of the reasons, uh, Sam Bragg, that we're that you're seeing that dollar strength. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, uh, that dollar rally and lack of supply to the higher is why, one of the reasons you're seeing the equity index weakness. That's what I meant to say. All right, so uh, you know, keep those two S&P supply zones in mind. And then with the NASDAQ, okay, uh, yes, we came off of our demand. We did not quite reach, make, it, make it to the supply. So if we do make a new high in this market, you know, today, tonight, what have you, into this level, uh, you're likely to see another little push lower. But again, it's not a high probability area. You know, yesterday we, uh, these are from our sessions, we had some blue circle demand zones. So these are levels that are developing. We just wanted to see more supply taken out above before we officially, uh, before these officially become uh, demand zones. And we, uh, we just didn't have that yet. Okay. Someone asked for the Nikkei. We look at the Nikkei a lot. And we had a fantastic 60-minute demand zone. I'll show you in a second here. Uh, there's that one. I don't know if we went over it in these ses their session the last time. But the nice thing about the Nikkei, if you trade the Nikkei, now this is a big money market, so don't just jump in and start trading it. Make sure you understand the risk involved and that you're okay with the risk involved. Uh, but notice our demand zone has been sitting well, you know, right below this uh, all this novice space, and that's why you're seeing price move so quickly. The Nikkei is very strong compared to the other equity index markets, especially markets like the DAX. Um, sitting above, we've been trading lower from this four-hour supply zone, uh, met multiple times, and you know you can see the range you have to deal with here. So that that little supply level I just showed you is inside all of this. Okay. And one more level to look at here. Let's see. Oh, yeah, those those 30-minute uh, demand zones. Now, you look at the move off our 60-minute demand in the Nikkei here. See that move? Now, compare it to what's going on in Europe. You'll see, uh, if we look at the DAX, for example, you'll see how weak the DAX is. See that? We didn't, yeah, you know, we got a rally, but not much of a rally. You know, the thing only rallied maybe uh, three to one. Maybe, um, whereas the uh, the Nikkei rallied, you know, a, a ton. So general weakness in Europe compared to Asia. Uh, no, Sam Bragg, we've got multiple ways that we track uh, track our performance. Yeah, uh, some of that, most of that performance is on the website. Uh, those results, but uh, but we have yeah multiple ways that we track it, and multiple ways that we keep it. Very important that you're you know you have proper assessment on what you're doing. Um, okay, so with that said, wanted to uh, make sure that we got through a number of markets and started to apply the stuff that we learned last session. If you want more of that, uh, you know, more, uh, more information on that, uh, you know, uh, challenges you need to deal with, anything like that. Then we do have these free workshops uh, coming up. There's the link in the chat if you're interested. You can always show up to a workshop and you'll uh, possibly learn a little something. And um, the nice thing about the workshop is they really deal with uh, challenges that people have. So, uh, but either way, great to be with you.
and we will see you next time. So we had our lesson session last time. We applied that some of that stuff that we talked about uh, this time, and next time we'll take the lesson part of this just a little bit further. Okay. Obviously, we can't go over, over everything in these free sessions. Um, that wouldn't be fair to our membership, but uh, we try to do the best we can and, and give the most uh, that we can. Have a great, uh, have a great rest of your week, everyone, and we'll see you next time.